morning, everybody, uh, or good evening, as the case may be. I'm Chris Eldred, the Public Relations Manager here at the Bruin Institute, and I'm really, really glad that you've joined us for the third in our series of events on the human scaffold, how not to design your way out of a climate crisis, a really, really interesting book by alumni Bruin fellow Josh Burson. Um, Human Scaffold was published uh, by the Bergeron Institute and the University of California Press as the second installment in our joint series on the great transformations of the 21st century. And we're especially excited to be supporting the research, uh, writing and publication of this book. Not that we're not excited about all the other books, uh, but in particular, this one really touches on all of the Bergeron Institute's work from the future of capitalism and democracy to the relationship between humans and the planet we live on and the processes we create, uh, its core ideas about our civilization's preoccupation with physical stuff and the limits this places on our response to the 21st century's major challenges. Uh, there's very um, little going on in the world uh, that that doesn't relate to. Um, so, Today, we're really excited to have Josh joined by the strategist, game designer, author, professor, and all around bright and thoughtful person, Von Tan, as they explore what our world could look like if stuff were not the only dominant way for people to engage with the world, with society, and with each other. Just for a little bit uh, more background, Josh is an anthropologist whose work explores the ecology of sentient behavior across time periods ranging from the momentary to the geological. He has held appointments at the Max Planck Institute for Human Cognitive and Brain Sciences and the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science, among other places. And in addition to the human scaffold, he's the author of 2015's Computable Bodies and 2019's The Meat Question. So uh, without any more buildup from me, I'll hand it over to Josh just to say a little bit more about Vaughn and to open up the discussion. Josh. Thank you, Chris. So I, I was aware of Vaughn long before he and I actually met. I, I think it was when I was uh, coming up on two years ago when I was promoting my last book, The Meat Question, and I was in Boston for an event with our mutual friend, Ben Wergaft. And one night, Ben and I were hanging out, and I think it was Gus Rancatori, the founder of uh, Tuscanini's Ice Cream, who said, you know, Josh should really meet Bond. And Ben said, yeah, Josh really needs to meet Bond. And I kind of tucked this away. And then a few months later, Bond's name came up again, again in, in a, a piece that, uh, that our mutual friend Jonathan Nunn published in The Guardian on what the, what the onset of the pandemic meant for the restaurant industry. And I said, you know, I really need to meet Vaughn. So I reached out and Vaughn and I started talking and we've been talking now for the better part of 16 months. And the, this, the theme of, of, the, of our conversation to, to, uh, well, this morning, if you're in LA or this evening, if you're in Europe, as Vaughn and I are, uh, the, the problems of having stuff it has been kind of a recurring theme of our of our of our back and forth. So I I could not I could not imagine anyone better than Vaughn bon or or anyone uh, equal to Vaughn bon in in uh, in approaching this this theme. So Vaughn bon is the author of the the uncertainty mindset. He has he wins the award for for title of the year since it appeared in in two thousand twenty. Uh, though it was uh, something, it was six or eight years in the making, a, a, a groundbreaking uh, ethnographic study of innovation in, in the restaurant industry. He is the designer and uh, promulgator of IDK, uh, a, a card-based game for, for uh, encouraging, uh, not, I don't know if out-of-the-box thinking is exactly the right term, maybe, maybe we'll get into IDK later, and a, a uh, as Chris said, a strategist and 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 man about town, but but the town will remain undisclosed. <laughs> so, so Vaughn, so I, I let's get to it. You know, we 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 were talking before before we came on the air. I get if, if it's if on the air is still the right phrase. We were talking about our various gripes with stuff, and you've you've just returned today. From from a trip to to London to di, to uh, dispose of, of some stuff. So, <laughs> but, uh... it's um well th thanks for having me and thanks for that very generous introduction. Uh, I think one one thing which one thing which has been going through my mind a lot in the last few days is is how hard it is to figure out when you're looking at a lot of stuff uh, what stuff really is important and what stuff isn't right because the idea of utility is so much bound up with 
the question of identity via stuff that it makes it makes stuff kind of very fraught you know it's not just a physical object it's like uh it's a way that you show that you are who you are. It's uh, a set of uh, links and connectors to personal history, to aspirations and all these other things. So I've been thinking about that a lot. Um, and I think that that probably intersects with several threads that um, make sense to talk about, but I'm not sure which one of those threads you wanna pick up at the moment. You know, I'm, I'm struck by, and this is a thread, this is something that I did not, I was not thinking about so much when, when I was formulating the book, but your use of the phrase of the word utility is really striking in part because of the word, the, the, the role that that word has in decision theory and, and uh, in, 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 uh, in finance economics. And I'm sure it's since, since you, since uh, uh, until quite recently, you were a professor at a business school. I'm sure it's a, it's a, it's a term that's familiar from your own, from, from your own professional milieu, but it's, it's it's so it's so interesting to think about how utility in the sense of of utility utility maximizing individuals right Homo economicus um, articulates with utility in the sense of the the use value that we get from yeah. stuff. This is this is I don't know if we should start there. Maybe we should uh, pin that and and return to it. But that's that's definitely one thread we right. we should pick up. I mean, how do you decide what what kind of what stuff is when you're when you're doing going through one of these periodic purges, and I go through them too, and I, I have my own thoughts on how. But what how do, what's your procedure? Do you have a a a a, a, a protocol for how you figure out what what you're going to keep and what you're going to? It, it's a it's a really good question. I, I think the the overarching theme of how I do it is I start with the best of intentions, and then I run out of steam very quickly, and then I stop. Um, but you know, I, I think we, we we could actually talk a little bit about this idea of utility and, and function, I guess. Let's do it. That actually is a big part of how I think about um, what to do with stuff and what stuff to keep and what stuff not to keep. Uh, I think one thing which which often comes through my mind when I'm looking at a thing, um, and, and I, I know you talk about uh, Mary Kondo and this idea of whether it sparks joy or not. Um, yeah. There. We, we, we should come to that at some point. Sure, we will, we will definitely come to it. We will certainly yes. come to it. <laughs> I think one, one thing which does factor into my protocol, if you will, is to think about whether or not this thing will be useful in some way. But the what I've found in the last few purges, because I've done maybe a purge every two or three years for the last 12 years. Uh, in the last few purges, I've come to realize that this is a real trap, right? Because the, the question of whether or not this object, whether it's a book, or an item of clothing, which we've also talked about, or a piece of equipment is useful, is partly, um, you know, it's, it's kind of like a weird morass that you, it's very hard to untangle yourself from. Uh, even if it has been useful in the past, the assumption that it will continue to be useful in the future is one that is often unchallenged by the person who's making the decision. And I've come to realize that at least for me, a big part of how I make a decision about whether something is useful is deeply aspirational, right? I want to be the person who reads right. <laughs> volume one and volume two of Theory and Society, and Economy and Society by Max Weber. I want to be the person who, I don't know, like goes camping with, I don't know, like a fairly technical, um, very lightweight tent. Those things, which generally, if I'm very honest with myself, I'm not gonna do. So I keep these things around because they, in a sense, signal something about who I want to be, which in the end generally doesn't happen. I'm not sure that it happens for you as well. No, no, it, it it absolutely happens. And in fact, there was a passage. So this this discussion for for those following along at home with the book uh, or or intending to this this uh, our discussion tonight for, uh, focuses largely on 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 the final major chapter of the book, chapter five, and. And there was a passage that, that was in an early draft of that chapter where I talk about uh, Margaret Radin, the, uh, the, the legal theorist, theory of, of, um, of uh, personhood property and as an alternative to, to, uh, to uh, so, so she, she offers this, um, this, this, uh, this genealogy of property in the European tradition that, that she, she identifies with Hegel and, and, and sets it up as a, as a counterpoint to the more, the more Lockean theory as, as of, of property is something that originates when we, we, we mix our labor with the, with the, with the raw materials of the earth, right? But, but the, this, this, uh, this, 
this concept of, of property that that um, that that has value to us by virtue of how it how it uh, becomes implicated in 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 our sense of personhood, our sense of who we are, is is one that that does figure prominently in 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 my own uh, theory of stuff, you could say. And it's it's definitely caught, it's something that that uh, whether or not I, I think about it reflexively enters into my thinking about what what I'll, what I'm going to keep and what I'm going to uh, get rid of when I when I go through a a, uh, a purge or or even when I simply have to when I'm going somewhere for six months and I'm, I'm thinking well what what am I going to want to have with me there and that's and books and clothes tend to be the categories where where this is most prominent for me I, I would say um, utensils too maybe you know there, there might be a, there might be a certain cup that I think well may I'll really want to drink from this from this cup but do I is it worth is it worth slapping it halfway around the world right where but but um but it, it it does tend to be books and clothes where where it's 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 clearest to me that that this is not just something that 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 has value because I I I might need to look something up or I might uh need to fall asleep and need help falling asleep one night and want to read something familiar uh or I might need to cover my my uh my body but uh but 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 rather I I would like to have this near me because it's because just it it has it has a certain aura it's uh it it um it it uh it, it it's it's one of the props out of which my my sense of self is is built that that's that that's clearly now that you say it, it it's it, that's a big part of how I decide what what am I going to keep you know when I, when I when I sift through things yeah um I I think one, one of the things that occurs to me about that is this sort of uh intertwining of how we construct how we think of who we are. Um, and I think one of the, I mean, it seems anyway that one of the things about the last few decades, I, I, I can't really say when it started because you know it's kind of been ongoing for some time, it, is this idea that we are more and more thinking about who we are and how we understand who we are as being constructed not via, um, know how, but by via objects that uh, we select, which represent some other system of identity for us. And I think what that does is it makes it very difficult to let go of stuff, right? Because when, when the object is just an object and it's like, you know, it doesn't really mean anything for who I am, it's very easy, relatively speaking, to get rid of it. But when it's bound up with your idea of who you are, not only to yourself, but to other people, then it becomes really, really difficult, right? So if you look at academics with, walls of books yes. um, in the office or if you look at um, I mean academics with walls of books in the office is a particularly I guess precise example of this problem but generally all of us sort of indicate our membership in groups based on not only how we act but also what we have and why we have it and I think that's right. what makes it very difficult to think about the stuff problem and um, and kind of disaggregate it because I think a lot of these things are conflated with each other um, to use a term that they often are imbricated and they are imbricated yeah. and you know it's what you say about professors in the wall of books strikes me for a number of reasons a couple of reasons one is that I, I remember uh, you know as a, as a as a PhD student early on so now going back whoa uh, 18 years the uh, whenever I was, whenever I was meeting with a professor for the first time, or or maybe the the third or fourth time, and you know you're you're in their office and they're they're on the phone and you're they're 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 finishing up making notes and you're waiting and you you have to you have to occupy yourself and you you have to make yourself invisible for a few minutes, but but they insist that you be in the office, right? So what do you do? You 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 look at their books and they and of course they know that you're doing that and that's 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 part of why the books are there. The books are on display. The books are way, are are are. It's a for you know in a, it it's a form of conspicuous display, right? It's it um they're 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 demonstrating to you that that uh, that 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 the reason you are there as a supplicant is because they've they've uh, they've had the experience that has led them to to assemble this this library that as one. Uh, as I recall, one person saying to me many, many years ago, you know, says it says it takes takes six months to you know, to uh, to get up and running again if you if you have to move across the country to take take a new position. And yet, at the same time, in some fields, 
uh, this this has gone away. So when I when I moved from from Munich, where I was attached to a uh, an institute that that focused mainly on environmental history, to Leipzig, where where I was embedded in a in a functional brain imaging group. Right, books are not part of of the the uh, the culture of of display in or the in uh, at in. Uh, in, in in that world at all, the whiteboard is central, right? And and there are certain there, there are mascots and certain certain uh, decorative indicia that 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 is strewn about the office, beanbag chairs and things like that. But but it has it has ceased to be books. In fact, there, this was something this was something that 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 came up at at a, at a party I attended my in my first week in Leipzig, where some, where someone was saying we have all these shelves in our offices because it used to be that that uh, that we kept books there and now apart from from spss manuals no one no one kept no one kept any books on the shelves they would use the they use the shelves for for other things for 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 empties from you know from the uh the 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 energy drinks they they uh they they drank when they were up all up all night running uh running uh recursive descent regressions but uh, it's be, it, it's the other thing that strikes me about what you said is that we 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 we've uh, over the past few decades you said you know we've we've become we've uh, we've come to be to be defined less by the specificity of our of our of our know-how than than by the stuff around us and yet even in the past over the past year and a half when when we've not when by and large people have not been spending as much time in each other's houses, right, or in each other's physical presence, and so you'd, you'd, you'd imagine that the curation of stuff would become less important. I don't know if that's if that's exactly how how things have unfolded. For sure, for sure, there's been lots of commentary about about changes in 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 standards of of uh, personal comportment and uh, be it, be it uh, be bathing less or not and not or wearing sweatpants all day because who, who can tell when you're where when you're doing on your all your calls on video but but at the, but just today I, in the in the financial times i was reading this this uh this um this uh, somewhat puffy piece about um uh, about uh treat brain or about the 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 compul the the compulsive dosing of 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 uh of rewards that, that that a lot of that a lot of people find themselves engaged in since this since the start of the pandemic. And at first, the author talks about things like um, getting takeout in the middle of the week or watching three hours of trashy television. But then it transpires that what a lot of her respondents um, have in mind when they think about treating themselves is buying durable goods that they don't need. Or or but or and and I I thought this is kind of interesting because this this is not this is not quite what I would have expected you know and and of course in some ways it's it's uh, you know you can you can think of it as 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 a problem of pent up demand if people are not traveling then they then they have then 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 they're they're going to find some other outlet for their for their disposable income but uh, in in the form of of stuff that they can they that they can use to to feather their nest but it's, but it it seems to run counter to the grain that the that the that that the that the role that stuff plays in our lives is to is is to establish who we are for for other people unless uh, unless it's become uh, such a part of how we of how of how stuff figures in our lives that we that that, that we continue to do it compulsively or um, even even when we're no longer able to. No, I, I think the big problem is it started out as, you know, if you buy the shirt um, or you wear this kind of clothing, you are obviously a member of this group. I think it's gotten to the point now where it is the fact that you now like these kinds of clothing or read these kinds of books. It, it is now something that we use to construct our identities to ourselves as well. Because I, I mean, obviously identity is something which is partly responsive to social context and socially constructed. But I think identity is also something that we we also self-construct, right? We we have these props. I I, I love the word props in this context because yeah. they are tools that you use to help kind of create a scaffold, if you want to use that <laughs> frame, um, on which to hang the pieces that make up yourself. Like otherwise, we're just kind of, you know, like what what is a person, right? Like a person can be all sorts of things. But one of the things that a person is today is is a whole collection of objects 
that not only signal to other people who we are, but also help signal to us who we are. Yes. Like, I am the kind of person who reads Faber. I mean, I love Faber, but when was the last time I actually read him? I, I think it may, it may well have been six or seven years ago. So, but then, so why do I keep all of these books by Weber around? It, it's, it's almost certainly not just to display externally so that other people yeah. know that I'm a Weber person because I want to think of myself as someone who reads and loves Weber, right? So I, I think that there is that, there are two parts to the problem of stuff at least and in the context of identity. And one of them is that we use it to signal to other people. But the other problem now is we use it to signal to ourselves as well. And that's why it's so hard to get rid of it. And, but we, so with, with, your, with your, your, your copies of Weber, is it, is it just that you're, you're trying to, that you're trying to signal to yourself that you're a certain person or when you see the, when you see the Weber on your, on your shelf, are you reminded of, some, is it, is it kind of uh, helping you, is it, uh, remember what what you're doing or why why you're why you're doing it I mean, maybe it maybe it serves a, a a useful function you know maybe it's 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 more than a form of display i i well the thing is i think the display part i, I would i would say display is useful if it's uh, meant to signal to others and for um when you turn it the opposite direction and you're thinking about it yourself or in my, I, I won't want to say it for everyone, but for myself, I think of it more like, um, you know, like a like a totem, or a okay, talisman, yeah, where the yeah. function is, the function may be socially constructed, but it's it's personally utilitarian. Like I have this object that makes me who I am, and the reason why I think it makes me who I am may have been because I've interacted with people who say that you are not a real sociologist unless you love Weber. So I actually truly, genuinely, personally love Weber. I just can't, re I just can't remember the last time I read any of it. Certainly not economy and society as a whole. I, I actually, to this day, I still don't know anyone who's read all of economy and society because it's massive. No, but this, this, the dual function of stuff is both, is, is things that are both functional and totemic is, is, uh, is, is, is worth pursuing. You know, I have, so, I, I, I've, uh, I, I have a, a, uh, a vegetable peeler that I really, really like, or, or, or rather a category, a kind of vegetable peeler that I really like. And it's the, it's the, um, the Kuhn Recon. Uh, Absolutely. It's the Y, uh, the y Carbon one, peel, right? Y peel. Yeah, okay. exactly. Yeah, really. And, and I actually, I got into an argument with, about this with, with someone, someone else who, who thinks very carefully about stuff. And this was this was this was just just a little less than a year ago, and it happened. This this person uh, was um, he was uh, he was my host. It was someone someone who I I I'd, uh, I'd let a a a flat from him in in uh, in Islington uh, on a number of occasions in the past, and then when I needed to go to London to uh, to to marry my sweetheart at the height of the pandemic, and had to ice had to uh, self isolate for two weeks. I I uh, I rang him up and. And he said, "Yeah, sure." So, um, so I was I was there, and I, I was pretty much confined to this twelve square meter, this hundred twenty square foot uh, uh, flat for for fifteen days. Yeah, I, I eventually, after after the first three or four days, he said, oh, "You can probably go out in the garden, you know, for for half an hour every day if you stay masked." So, um, so, so I. But apart from that, I was inside, and we 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 were chat we were texting, and. And we 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 got into this conversation about like the what what kind of stuff we used around the kitchen around the house. And he he uh, he had run a, a CNC lathing uh, mill and a and a and a, uh, a a fabrication shop at one point. And he was he was in the process of of dramatically altering uh, making wholesale structural alterations to his own home next door, like, like moving, moving the bathroom from one side of the house to the other and refixing the kitchen. He was very, you, you could say he was very handy. You know, he had taught, um, he, he was a trained carpenter, electrician, and he, he thought a lot about the stuff in his life. And I said, yeah, I really like this. I really, I have this, uh, this vegetable peeler and I brought it with me from New York because I really like it. And he said, but, but that's a cheap piece of, I said, the, the handle's made out of ABS. There's no way even to recycle that at the end of its life. And I said, look, yeah, but you know, but, but that's, but part of the appeal is that if it, if I, if I, uh, if I lose it, you can buy them in three packs for $10, 
right? If I lose one, then it's okay. it doesn't matter, right? It's, but it, and, and yet, functionally, it is the best peeler. And he said, but he said, but you just wrote this book that that ends with this with with uh, with this this lament about how we're you know, pumping plastics into the ocean. I said, yeah, it's yeah, I did, but um, but uh, but this is the best peeler, and and it's and that and I I love it because it will peel anything. It will it you, you can take the world right off your thumb if you're not careful. But it's yeah. but it but it changes how you eat when you have something like that. You you've got to try it. it but um and and it's it's completely disposable. It's 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 a total commodity, and yet it's it's both highly functional and it's become because of because of how it functions, sort of an integral part of who a, a totem f- for me, right? So that I so that when I, when I think about okay, I'm 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 uh, I'm flying from from one part of the world to the other. What do I have to take with me? This this thing is the first one of the first things that I that, that I grab. So interesting. Um, you you may you may enjoy knowing that Kunri Khan also makes an all steel version of this peel. They do. Okay. Okay. I, I happen I, to have one downstairs. Of course you do. It, it is a very good peeler. Um, so you you can deal with that particular objection about its um, multi unnecessarily multi material oh. nature, uh, which I, I agree with. But you know you can I agree deal, with you can I agree solve with the problem. Too. But uh, okay, so but uh, and I th- I found it interesting that you knew exactly which peeler I was it, I was going. There is, to... there is only one. I mean, I think the general form of the peeler that works is not the the stick peeler, but the Y peeler. And there's right. lots of. I mean, there there are some. I mean, Oxo makes one that has a in my opinion, unnecessarily over-designed rubbery handle. I, I've tried it, it doesn't yeah. work, yeah. It, but yeah. The, I, I think the, the simple stainless steel version um, is the best. And in fact, it, it used to be an object that American cooks doing stages in the EU would bring back across to the US. Um, I understand because it, it used to be hard to find these. They were really good. They were really, really good for peeling very quickly, like potatoes and things like that. Yes. So uh, they would come back with, as you, I mean, you say it, it's a commodity product, right? It's a, it's a product of an industrial process, inexpensive and works great. And so they come back with like 10 packs in their bags, if I recall correctly, um, because it's so good. So yes, absolutely. Who wouldn't know about the Kuhn Recon um, Y-shaped peeler? It's this is this is actually not an um, not 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 a complete surprise that we should that we should hone in on this. There was a there was um oh the the author's name unfortunately is escaping me now. But there was a a, a very fine essay years ago in in either the American Ethnologist or Cultural Anthropology about uh, about um, uh, uh, by a, a, an anthropologist of Russia who had uh, had sent her sent her. Uh, her host, her host community, um, a, a a set of these these OXO uh, good grips peelers as a as a gift, right? Yeah. And she went back at some point years later, and they, it, because because she because the woman in the in 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 the settlement where she spent her time would spend half the day peeling potatoes, right? This was a big part of their life, and she went back later and and found that they weren't that they were still peeling the potatoes with these with these old paring knives, and she said and she she made inquiries. And she said, and they said, look, we we love the peelers were really good. They were much they were much easier on the hands, but they took off too much of the skin. They, they took off too much of the potato. So we we went back to 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 doing it the hard way. So this is this is a category of object that that uh, that does play an intimate functional role in in people's lives. And it's uh, uh, if you haven't if you haven't given thought to uh, uh, to 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 your vegetable peeler, you should you. You, yeah. you, sh- you should try it, you know. If... Right, right. Well, I, I think one, one, one thing which I actually really wanted to talk to you about is this idea that um, we're increasingly using stuff as a substitute for competency, right? So you, you know how if you're like an ultra light hiker, right. the idea is that you, um, the more you know, the less you need. Right. And you, and you know, because you know more, you know exactly how much you can trim down so that you are still safe. And you can still do the things that you want. So um, there, there is a, uh, I think he's a professor of English, but uh, he teaches at the University of New Mexico, his, Stanley Crawford. Yeah. Uh, so he, he's got a great phrase called the pound weight of the real, right? So it, it w- w- which is basically this idea when he was making Adobe bricks for his house in New Mexico, when he, when he first moved out there, 
Um, he calculated that even though the, an individual brick is not that heavy, in the course of producing it and laying it, you lift it so many times, the effective weight of the object is huge. And right. I, I think the, the, the lightweight hiker example, and I, I know that you are also interested in highly technical, um, mass efficient equipment. <laughs> It, I've, uh, I've, hiking, I've, I've, I've repented hiking, a little bit. I've, I've, uh, I've, 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 uh, I've come to ruin my, my obsession with, with ultra high molecular weight polyethylene over the past year. But, um, but, but yes, I, I was, I, I, I was sort of at the edge of this world for, 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 for a little while. Yes. So, so Stanley Crawford and the, 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 yeah. the power. But, but so the, the thing is, you know, it, if you don't know, then you have all this stuff. And I think you can kind of extrapolate that a little bit um, to say something like, if you are insecure about who you are and what you can do, right. you have lots and lots of stuff right. as a way to compensate. And that's certainly, I mean, I, I don't want to sort of extend that to everyone. That's certainly been the case for me, right? Like, I don't know how to do all this stuff. I'm going to buy things to replace my lack of competency. And then as I develop the capacity to right. do it myself, all of these things no longer become necessary. And right. it, it is, it is not, it's probably not the only thing that's going on um, in terms of hoarding of stuff and buying of stuff, but I think it's a significant thing. And, well, and the, the marketing plays on that and getting people to buy it. No, there's, 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 uh, there's a lot to this. It, it, uh, you know, because we're, we've, uh, we've come to rely on, on stuff to, we, you know, we have stuff that does very particular things, right? And the, the, uh, the, 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 da the Amazon dash button is the is is kind of the the nip plus ultra of this right it's a it, it's a it's this this elaborate multi-material uh, construct and it's 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 really it's a button straight out of a out of a chuck jones cartoon right where where you press it and and something and one one particular kind of thing is delivered yeah. to to your house Correct. so that but that, that that and that that for me exemplifies the the, the hyper specialization of stuff. Whereas the more the the, the more you understand how to, the, the more com let's say the more confident you feel moving through the world, the le the the less specialized your toolkit becomes. Absolutely, right? you, sure. You 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 have because you understand that there are, there are there are a small number of things that 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 you really need and and that each of which can serve in a in a, in a, in a number of roles. Mm -hmm. I mean this in in a way you've you've. You've you've offered us the perfect segue to the this thing we were discussing just before we we started about the 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 bug out bag as the as perhaps the metaphor or perhaps the metonym it might might no longer be metaphor of of uh, of of our of of our predicament right you, uh, if you if if you if you live increasingly if you live in an, in a place that that might be. Uh, subject to fire, say, or to or to flood, or to landslide, or or just uh, as an example, just as an example, yeah. uh, you you, um, you 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 find yourself thinking about well, what what kind of if if I were if I were given fifteen minutes to evacuate, you know, what how how would I do it? I actually I actually talked to someone a few weeks ago who who uh, who was in this situation. She said, you know, we went we went through this and then. And I didn't have one the first time, and so now I have one, right? And this this used to be something that 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 uh, that that um, yeah, you you would you would associate you know with 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 Lee Child novels, right? The 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 idea of a, of a bug out bag, and now it's and now it's become, or maybe maybe we're all living in a Lee Child novel. I thought for a while we were living in a Michael Crichton novel, or maybe a, a Kobo Abe novel, but it could be. That um, if you think about in in a way, Jack Reacher exemplifies the the paring down of one's toolkit to the to to the minimum. He has a toothbrush and a debit card, and that and that's it, right? It, it it's it's worth pointing out also that um, William Gibson's kind of protagonists are often also people who often by force of circumstance, not necessarily their own choice, also have nothing but in many but, cases. For instance, a coat that they picked up of someone else. Right, ends right. Up being the only possession. So, yeah, I, I think that there is a there is a certain kind of almost fictional property to the um, to the qualities of the bug out bag. And, and, there, and there, now that now that we're increasingly living in what appears to be a fictional world, <laughs> uh, maybe that's the reason why it's becoming more important. This, um, you know, the 
the the the the book of Gibson you're referring to pattern recognition where 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 the protagonist case Pollard said is is said by one of her contemporaries to to live exclusively in in CPUs in case Pollard units which are black t-shirts and 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 uh, and and uh, and uh, black jeans but she has one nice jacket a Buzz Rickson's replica yeah. MA1 that she, yeah. which, which at the time did not exist in black and at, <laughs> and and after the book came out and people started calling up Buzz Rickson's, which is a a you know, a, 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 a Japanese uh, heritage mining no no uh, uh, they're, they're, they're like a clothing manufacturer that specializes I would say in like uh, otaku re replicas of of his historical clothing. I guess. Sure. And they they said they got in touch with Gibson and said, "Why did you do this?" And we're getting calls. And so they, they so so they ended up having to having to produce this replica MA one because it had appeared on a fictional character in uh, in, in a book. And I, I we are living more and more in 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 a world where there's this 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 kind of mutual recursion between uh, between fiction and and. Well, wh whatever it is that's outside fiction, maybe there is no 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 more outside fiction. Or right. Maybe, maybe everything has become one. Yeah, we haven't we haven't yet we haven't yet caught up, right? But um, but and so, and I guess and padding our lives with stuff is a way. You know, if you if you're if you're surrounded by things that you can stub your toe on when you when when you get up at night, right? That that shows you that you're that you're not. You're not living in a dream world, or you're not you're not living in a <laughs> yes, fictional exactly. world, right? That you're that you're act, you're actually there. It's 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 sol it, it obeys the rules of physics as you as. Right. You <laughs> yeah, well, but you, you know the the interesting thing about that is it, is that a kind of weird false comfort? Because if you think about a situation in which you would need a a go bag, uh, yeah, the all of the stuff becomes a liability at that point, right? Because you, you know, like the. So let, let, let's kind of trace the thread. Like if stuff has come to define who we are and we've accumulated a lot of it so that we know who we are and we are sure that we're not living in a simulation, for instance, then if we are forced to leave it behind and we don't have any other way of being who we are, then what happens to us, right? So that, then the, the, the bug out bag. So that, this is why it was like a metaphor, right? Because what do you choose to take with you? And if you've left all this other stuff behind and it, is who you are, then have you just left bits of yourself behind, trailing behind you in the right. world? Um, it, it, I mean, I think it's it's a it's a really it's a it's a question that until fairly recently you you wouldn't have to you wouldn't have to answer for yourself if you were not in a region torn by war or if you weren't in a region that was extremely prone to natural disasters. It's just the the world that we're increasingly living in is one where these things are now happening in more and more places. They're, they're no longer happening just on the margins of places. They're, they're not happening everywhere. And it's, it's going to be more and more difficult, I think, to be people defined by stuff in a world where stuff is also like an albatross, if you will, around your neck. And, you know, it's not, it's not just something, it, it's not just a, uh, the, the, the conditions that make stuff an albatross are not just things that arise uh, um, catastrophically, as it were, mm -hmm. in, in, like a fire or even or even a slow moving catastrophe like a like a pandemic. You know, when when I was writing this book, one of the one of the, the, the I I kind of had this book in mind for for seven years before I started writing it. So so going back to the the last the last event, um, some 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 viewers may recall I. Uh, I, I read this this uh, this this um, woefully wrong paper about um, about uh, the uh, the archaeology of, of early Holocene Tasmania and, uh, in late 2011, and I thought some someday I'm going to have to write a book about this and explain why it's wrong. And I, I tucked that away, and, and then over the the ensuing years, I found myself having to pare down my life and my, sort of my my uh, my personal circumstances began to began to merge with the with the the uh, the the anthropological themes that I wanted to address in this book that was never going to get written. And finally, th um, uh, things con converged. F fiction and reality met in Los Angeles in in September two thousand eighteen, and. When I was when I just arrived in LA, I'd never lived there before, and we uh, I I was uh, renting a cottage in Highland Park, 
And the so I was I was going in regularly to the Bird Bruin offices in the Bradbury building in downtown LA. And I was uh, uh, for the first two months I uh, lived in LA, believe it or not, I did not have a car. And so I was taking the 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 gold line. And on the walk, the 20 minute walk from where I was living in Highland Park to the nearest uh, the nearest metro stop, I I became aware that there uh, of of how many people in Los Angeles, or not not of how many, but of but of the scale of the problem, as it were, the, of the of the number of people in Los Angeles who are who are underhoused. And I say underhoused because they 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 have some kind of uh, durable sh shelter that they, that they return to every night, but it's not it's not a house in the in the in the way we've become we've become accustomed to thinking about it. It's it's a car maybe right, and maybe they have dispensation to sleep in the car in a particular parking lot overnight. And, and L A in particular has begun issuing permits uh, to this end, or maybe maybe it's a maybe it's a a, a caravan a trailer. Right, and so we, I would see these uh, these these tra these um, recreational vehicles parked on the side of the uh, uh, road uh, on the on my route down to the to the the metro station, and it was it was it was clear that the people were were just living there. Uh, you know, you'd see them running their dogs in the morning, and they were perfect uh, perfectly nice people. Um, and one of the quirks of the of the LA metro system is that it was built. With, so that there are no none of these stations uh, have have commuter parking lots, which does it, which seems self defeating, but that's another <laughs> story for another another hour. And I so I and that's so I I began to think about this, you know, as I that this I was observing this when I first moved in and I was writing the first half of the book, which is more about the deep past and it's much more technical. But I and I was thinking, wondering about how I was going to tie this into the contemporary world. But the the this this problem of curating a, a stuffful life, or of curating a life at all, you know, which which ent entails a certain um, uh, durable relationship with stuff, in in a world where 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 um, we we can't rely on on a, on a basic entitlement to housing is 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 as much as 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 extreme a problem for for a growing number of people certainly in the united states um as the as the problem of well what what what's going to happen to our stuff when the hurricane comes or the or the flood comes or the or the fire comes i don't you know i don't i though i bring this up in the book i don't really know i'm, I'm still struggling to to know what to what exactly to, to uh to 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 say about it in Berlin right now there's a there's a the the municipal elections are afoot and there's a a ballot initiative on the uh, uh, on the ballot this year to ex essentially expropriate a tens of thousands of privately held uh, rental housing units many of which were were many many of which were were actually sold by the city. To the 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 current uh, uh, commercial landlords twenty years ago, right? Yeah. Um, and like right and to buy in the UK. sorry, like right to buy in the UK. Yeah, yeah, exactly. but the, well, but well, no, these were not. They were not sold to. This was not where they were sold to their to their current tenant to the to their oh. then tenant. They were so they were sold to commercial landlords, and the commercial okay. landlords yeah. now let them out at yeah. um, at market rates, and it's a very highly regulated rent market. And the at the federal level, the the um, the, the the government is quite concerned because the uh, re uh, protections for long term renters have been so strong that they've created disincentives toward toward getting getting on the property ladder, which are which are playing into a, a growing uh, in, a wealth inequality uh, in Germany as elsewhere in, in Europe. Um, but but in but in Berlin, the concept of 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 lifelong renting remains popular, and so the so the so the so the popular strategy now is simply to take back take back all these units from from commercial landlords and have the city manage them and rent them out at at uh, at, at reasonable rates at below market rates. Um, the, um, and the, so the so the the initiative hinges on a an up to this point untested provision 
of the German constitution. So there's a there is a constitutional provision for eminent domain, but there's there's not there's no case law around it. So so even if the initiative yeah even if the initiative passes and and uh, uh, and the and the the uh, the Zenat the 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 city government acts on it. It, yeah. it will be t- they'll they'll end up spending you know tens of millions of euros improving that it's constitutional and then con- and then compensating the the, the owners and the, and ten years will go by right with um but but uh, but but the so I'm I'm not sure it's it's a strategic move but at the same time there's a there's, it's 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 easy to understand the underlying problem which is that people want to feel secure in their homes whether or not. It, it, not 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 simply because they want to be surrounded by their stuff. Mm-hmm. In a way, being surrounded by stuff becomes a compensation for for not having security in in, in, uh, in uh, uh, of tenure in in, uh, in in your home. Right? If you knew if you 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 almost you wouldn't need um, you you wouldn't you wouldn't be inclined to keep so much stuff with you if you actually if if you knew that that uh, that. That you had a place to live, yeah. yeah. Well, I think the the thing the thing that we seem to keep coming back to is this idea that some stuff actually has function, and maybe that's why we have it. Like the I don't know, like the the vegetable peeler, for instance, right? But then there are whole categories of our relationship to stuff that um, that whole categories that are born out of insecurity of some sort. Yes, and. And I think that that's one of the things that is not only a consequence of our problematic relationship with stuff, but it's also causing the, you know, it's one of those like, like um, the snake eating is like Jormungand, right? Snake eating yeah. its own tail. It's like both causing and causal, um, caused by and causing the, the, the stuff problem. I think the, the thing about stuff, as I think we, we are probably unpacking a little bit, is there are so many aspects to why it is problematic to have it and to interact with it and relate to it. And I think we often just conflate it all because yeah. there is this idea nowadays that minimalism is good and maybe minimalism of stuff is good in some sense, but it's not always good, right? Sometimes the fact that we are responding to that is an indication of particular social positions that not everyone can have, I, well, all those things that, that, that you know about. So- No, of course, it, be, it, be, it becomes a, another form of conspicuous display, right? Absolutely. There's, 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 certain, there's certain brands and certain kinds of products that there's sure. certain, certain things that you wear or, or keep in your home that, that signal to others that, 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 yeah. that, you do, that you're not invested in stuff or that totally. you've done away with all your- yes. ultra, ultra light. Ultra light is one of those. It's it's a whole world of the most expensive possible version of a thing that is you know it's it's a hundred percent more expensive because it's removed the last like eight percent of mass before it becomes completely non functional. I mean that's exactly the kind of conspicuous um, unstuffing. That, <laughs> I mean I, I don't know. It's like it, is it a weird form of post capitalism? Probably not. It's probably the almost the apotheosis of capitalism, right? Where it's, I think about it's it, this a lot. <laughs> no, it, it, is the, it, it is in some ways the apotheosis, apotheosis of, of capitalism because, it, it, because the stuff itself, uh, you, 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 you no longer have to feel, there's, there's, there no longer has to be any, uh, any material relationship between the, be, between the, uh, the, the, the use value and the, and the, and, and the the signaling value of, of the thing, right? It's the fact that there is no material that 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 something is is so uh, materially attenuated as to as to be pra- as as to as to be practically useless, right? That that that, yes. that, that but, but not that, quite useless. Not quite. Not, not quite. quite. Some, That's the thing. It's like you've gotten to the very limit of you know removal conditioning on functionality and in order to get there you know like the whole like 80 20 like which i don't really subscribe yeah. to but 80 20 rule generally is kind of directionally correct that it's easy to get rid of 80 percent, and the last 20 percent is going to be l- extraordinarily ludicrously expensive cognitively and emotionally to get rid of and you've got the same thing going on when you're making ultralight gear because then you've got to you, you've got to pick like a material that's like hard to work with and super light like titanium or you have to pick a, a material that's like you know extremely rare. Like what's that thing that the um, the, the that um, SDR um, 
Mixed. Oh, 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 oh right. Uh, yes, yeah, dyneema. Right, non, non-woven. Right, ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. Yeah, um, yeah it's, there's, the the tide has turned. People are turning against it now. I mean, I I have one bag that in it that that I have to say I I'm, I adore. Would I would I um, and it, it's highly functional, right? I'll I'll take it anywhere. It's been on an, uh, a billion continents, but but I I pro- I would not buy. You know, I I bought it I guess seven years ago, and I would not buy it today. But it but it will outlive me. I will have, I'm stuck with it now for another 40 years, which is, which is the way I want it. If I'm going to buy something that can't, that, that yeah. is not made as, as people in the apparel and soft goods yeah. industry would say of a biological nutriment, right. That, yeah. that, then, then it's, it, it had better, it had better, um, you, you know, I'd better run it into the ground. I'd better get yeah, sure. e- extract every. <laughs> for sure. Use it up, wear it out, make it do or do without. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, I'm trying to think what I'm trying to think what what else we what else we haven't covered. You know, there was one one of the things I, I get into in this chapter in the chapter of the book that that provided the the instigation for our discussion is the is the the question of, of games that we play with stuff. And so the examples the, there there are all kinds of examples, and I talk about of course the um, um, the I, I talk about the Trober and Islanders, but uh, but the the example that really spoke to me that that I rehearsed ad, ad nauseum in the book is comes from a novel by Gerald Mernon, who is an an, an Australian novelist, um, and it's from his first novel Tamarisk Row, published in 1974, and it's about the games that that a a young boy imagines being played with marbles, and in in you know, these are not marble games with marbles as we think of them, because in fact he's he's afraid to take his marbles to school and and uh, and shoot marbles because he doesn't want to lose them because he because he's um because he 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 sees the marbles that he's accumulated as as uh, as tokens in this this multi continent system of of uh, of, of the, cir- the the circulation of goods which are inherently valueless they have a certain they have a certain sensuous value right so some of them are you you, you look you look at the at the at the walls of glass and and it's there's there's some intrinsic appeal but mainly what's appealing about them to um to this boy growing up on the plains of of uh, northern victoria in the 1940s is imagining so a is a, a a a young woman working in a factory in West Virginia, um, which, which is a fantasy he's developed by reading National Geographic magazine, packing up these these marbles, right, and have and imagining how they how they made their way across the United States and then across the Pacific Ocean to Australia, and how they made how how they made their way in, inland to to Bassett to this town on the on the inland plains where where he lives, and so so for him it's. It's the it's the the uh, the, um, the the journey that the that the stuff has taken that uh, that 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 gives it value, right? It's not, and he he doesn't even want to show it to to other to the other kids at school, right? He'll he's, he'll he'll take them out and play with it and play with the marbles, and when he's home alone, and or he'll he'll go into into his backyard and pretend that they're horses and race them with uh, stage horse. Uh, horse races with them but but um but it, but so i there is this you know we do we do play these these um these long distance exchange games with stuff and it, and it's it's interesting to kind of uh reframe certain historical uh, passages in in our in, in or passages in in the history of our relationship with stuff as as games in the long distance exchange and you know in the in, in the creation of the, the creation of charisma simply by virtue of the fact that one has 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 uh, has withheld something from exchange and then at exactly the right moment put it into exchange. I mean, we were talking about this before before we came on. You know, you you've just given away a bunch of books and 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 it, it gave you it gave you quite a, a quite a lot of pleasure to to uh, to 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 send those books away, right? So totally, and- well, it gave me pleasure because. Not because I was just, I mean, it gave me pleasure because I was getting rid of books, but it also gave me pleasure because in each one of those cases, the books were, I think that the recipient would have derived significantly more pleasure, utility, whatever you want to call it, from them. Um, And and so I I want to contrast that with another kind of game, which I think you're also familiar with, uh, which is the weaponization of stuff. So, you, you know, one of the things about 
these like long distance exchange networks um, is that we often think of them as happening uh, across space, you know, like lapis lazuli that goes from Afghanistan to like some other place where it's really right. valuable. But I think that there's also, especially in um, the East Asian cultures that I'm familiar with, there's also the weaponization of stuff through gift giving across time. Oh, yes. And that, and I think, and that's actually, it plays into the things that we have been talking about because if we didn't care so much about stuff, you could not weaponize it. But now that you care about stuff so much, you can weaponize it by giving someone a gift that they must reciprocate, for instance, that they simply cannot afford to reciprocate, right? right. And you can bankrupt people in that way, which, which is a very interesting thing, which I think fictionally at least does seem to happen. I'm not sure if it actually truly does happen. But yeah, that, I think that, that's another kind of game that we don't really talk about um, at all. No, it's, it's, it's not, you know, it, uh, so much, so much our, of the stuff of the, the games we play with stuff are variants on competitive feasting. And yet, this is a when That's you think about competitive feasting, you know, um, the way the way it's like presented, and stuff like yeah, potlatching. The way the way potlatching is presented is as a form of redistribution, right? So, so the a, a big man can afford to give away all all his blankets, right? And and in that way, uh, every everyone has something warm for the winter. But that and that there's there's a certain element of that. But the way it was, the way it was played in most parts of the world. Or in many parts of the world, was it was uh, as as competition in a in a purer sense. So if you if you look at at, at the way potlatching worked in in the the New Guinea Highlands until quite recently, right? You would you would come to someone to a feast that someone else gave, and you would take a piece of string and measure the biggest yam, and then when it was your turn to give the feast, you would damn well better have a yam that was longer, <laughs> or you or you would you would feel that you had lost you had lost face, right? Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Uh, or or worse, right? Like um, you you might then be denied something that comes with sure. you know, all, all these things. Exactly, you would you would you would be denied opportunities to to participate in these in the even bigger games of stuff that mm -hmm. that the that the community was playing with uh, with with white men, which is a category that uh, is identified by my, by our colleague Ira Bashko, right? Who uh, who talks about how how white men as a as a as a, as a category of person. Is it, is it um, became implicated in the in these in in these uh, these archiva games uh, games with stuff um, and 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 how he as an anthropologist found himself implicated you know how they how the how his archiva um, uh, counterparts had had very particular ideas about the kinds of stuff that that he needed to to keep up his body because because he was developed right he needed a, a better sleeping mat. He needed sunscreen. He needed all this stuff that that uh, that local people did not need because he was from he was from far away, but also because he he led a a, a this aspirational developed life. And in a way, becoming developed was about losing losing the understanding of how how to make your way in the world without stuff. It was about becoming more reliant on, on stuff. Um, I think that so I, I'm just also very conscious that we're coming up to time. Yes. Um, and so I, I don't know, how, how do you normally do this? I, I think, Josh, uh, do you want to kind of just wrap us up in some? You know, way? yeah, let's let, let, I can take us out to, um, you know, this is, this is, uh, the third in this, this series of, of, uh, of live recorded podcasts that the Berg Bruin Institute has, has, uh, graciously, um, stage and uh, to, to mark the release of the human scaffold. So I want to express my, my thanks to, to our, our partners at the Berg Gruen, um, and, uh, uh, and in particular to to Chris Eldred, Sarah Gilman, and Rachel Bauch for for their help all along um, over the past few months. But it's uh, it's really been a privilege to get to do this, and I would, and and if if anyone uh, has been watching or or later listens to the podcast, and you and I would I would love to hear from from uh, from listeners. Uh, what what they feel you can you can find way find, figure out how to contact me from 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 my website. Um, beyond that, you know, as far as I I don't really have a, a, a on on the theme of our conversation today. I don't I I don't have um, I'm still struggling with stuff. Where where uh, you you've just you've just uh, uh, disposed of a lot of your stuff in London. Um, uh, Jesse, my partner, and I are in the process of of um, of closing our house, putting our house in sublet mode because we're both in, uh, singly and, and jointly going to be spending 
the, uh, the better part of the next half year in uh, in North America. Uh, and and it's it's only then that that you realize how much stuff is implicated in keeping up a house, right? Like cutting boards, knives, bowls, right? All this. All you, maybe you only need one for yourself, but but um, but but uh, but stuff has a tendency to to proliferate. And I'm, I'm not. I mean, the the point of this book and the point of the of the chapter is not that that we should all live without stuff. That we should. That but that but that we we need to we need to kind of formulate a more reflexive uh, way of thinking about uh, our stuff. So, so thank you, Vaughn, for, for, for helping me uh, in, my, in, my, in my struggle. Uh, it, it was a great pleasure. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, yeah and, and thank you both very much uh, for your time and insights. Um, I hate to cut off the discussion now. Um, but uh, just for the sake of the audience, uh, if you found this discussion interesting, and I hope you did, uh, Josh's book is The Human Scaffold, uh, and it's available now from UC Press. Uh, I strongly recommend it. Um, but yeah, other than that, thank you very much, Josh Burson and Von Tan, and thank you to the audience for listening. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Vaughn. That was excellent. I know. That was super Once fun. Again, you, you kept me.